So Happy New Year and welcome to the first event in the JSC lecture series uh, for 2022. Uh, my name is Fabio Gigi. I'm the chair of the Japan Research Center uh, here at SOAS. And with me are Professor Naonori Kodate uh, from the University College Dublin and Professor uh, David Prendergast from Maynooth University, uh, both in Ireland. Uh, the title of today's event is Can Robotics Aided Care Be Person Centered? And it will be a talk followed by the screening of the film by Professor Prendergast called Circuits of Care. So um, for the format today, um, we decided to have a, a brief introductory talk uh, by Professor Kodate beforehand because he is uh, in Japan. So you can calculate the time difference. It's now about two o'clock uh, in the morning. Uh, so we are very thankful uh, for him to join us. Uh, we'll start off with that. And then David Prendergast will introduce uh, the film um, we'll take a few questions um, at the beginning, and then um, we'll uh, return to watch the film together, and we'll take uh, some more questions um, at the end. Please feel free uh, to use the chat for questions, uh, but you also will be able um, to unmute and to speak up um, if you raise your hands. We also have the queue uh, the question and answer function that um, you can uh, use for that purpose. Okay, uh, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, uh, our first speaker, uh, Professor Naonori Kodate, who is Associate Professor uh, in Social Policy and Social Robotics at University College Dublin, and he's the founding director of the UCD Center for Japanese Studies, which is, in a sense, um, our new collaboration partner, and I'm really uh, happy that you are here uh, and to extend, um, you know, uh, because we're both interested uh, in very uh, similar uh, topics uh, here. Um, he has uh, done extensive research uh, in e-healthcare uh, in STM, and he has uh, written uh, about robotics-aided uh, care systems uh, working with teams in Ireland and Japan. Uh, Hong Kong and in France. So I hand over to you um, for the first uh, introductory note. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Fabio Sensei, and welcome everybody and uh, Happy New Year. Um, so um, I'm delighted um, to be part of this session with um, David, um, Professor Brendagast, and um, I'll be I try to be quick um, because I'm sure everybody joins and this session for the film. Um, so let me just share my slides. I just wanted to give you some context um, to this film and also um, talk a little bit about a few projects that are related to um, today's talk. So if I can make it work. So the, the starting point for me um, as a researcher, because I'm trained, um, I'm a political scientist by training, um, and then got retrained as a kind of applied social scientist um, working in the field of safety and patient safety to start with. And that brought me into um, another area completely, but um, loosely related to safety as well. So my angle to this, and the whole subject is actually coming from um, safety science. And 2016, um, the team of um, researchers in Chiba University and my team in UCD, University College Dublin, um, tried to get EU funding. Um, probably a lot of um, people in the audience are sympathetic to the fact that we are trying to um, get funding um, to make our project work. And so then since then, um, we had had several seminars or robotics um, related um, seminars and this is way before the pandemic so we always had some visitors speakers and um, flying from flying from from japan and then um 2018 um, we managed to get um funding from toyota foundation and that is the project um which is um thankfully i i got to meet david and then we made the film so the project is entitled Harmonization Towards the Establishment of Person-Centered Robotics AD Care System, and we call it HARP, um, HARP Rocks. 
And then the researchers are based in four jurisdictions, um, Ireland, Japan, Hong Kong, and France, uh, which Fabio Sensei already mentioned. And they are all coming from different disciplines. So from medicine, nursing, um, engineering, um, to social work, sociology, anthropology, and so on. And like people like myself, um, social policy. And I think for most of you, um, probably this is redundant. Um, everybody knows um, Japan is a very rapidly aging um, society. And some of the key aspects is really about the, the skewed demographic. Um, so it's getting worse and worse and it's the, the pace is actually picking up. So the, um, the baby boomer, the second baby boomer will become um, an older person and by 2040 and 2050 and by 2060 or probably uh, more than 40 percent of the whole entire population will be um 60 those um 65 years old and older and that's the background demographic aspect but that doesn't necessarily mean we need to have um robotics aided care but um japan and south korea in particular in east asia um had a very regulated institutional care um, setting. Um, so care, care has been, on one hand, care has been a core public voice of matter and long-term care insurance system um, that were introduced in both countries basically made um, social care um, as a kind of potential engine for, of economic activation. Um, but in other parts of Asia, Asian <clears throat> countries, it's much more liberal private market driven um, scheme. So um, it's strictly private family responsibility and active use of migrant care labor within private home. And um, that is a dominant form. And then what happens in Japan with the combination of um, rapidly aging um, population and then the lack of and um, the shortage of care workers coming from overseas is the shortage of um, care. Um, professional um, stuff. So 380, this, this is based on the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare um, data. Now it's becoming a bit old, 2016, but um, they estimated 380,000 people um, in, in short, um, in terms of um, provision of um, workforce. And then the government um, had a strategy. And um, so in a sense, it's all sort of a all Japan approach to this, the shortage of care workers. And then there are three types of care robots. In Japan, the definition of robots is sort of broader than other countries, but it normally includes these um, three types. So physical support, support um, type, and then independent support type to basically um, assist and aging in place. And then the third one is more social and um, assistive robots, um, which includes communication and safety monitoring and so on. And now they are supported um, by government funding. And so that's the incentive um, for bringing in, um, in technologies. And you will see in the film um, a particular um, nursing home where um, technologies are used, not just robots, but the monitoring system um, and so on. So basically the idea is not to replace um, human care workers, but to um, supplement or sort of enhance the quality of care. So it's all connected to communication robots, it, you know, being connected up with the um, safety monitoring system. And they, if something untoward happens, so basically falls during um, the night shift, then they have this silhouette sort of a type um, video um, screen to actually learn what actually happened. Um, so they use it as a support mechanism for care stuff. So it's, it is fundamentally for um, supporting older people, but also supporting um, care workers. And the findings so far, like in terms of the use of care robots, um, it actually um, enhances quality of life for both older adults and care staff. And some of the socially assisted robots, communication robots can be effective to for older adults with moderate dementia. Um, and as I showed, uh, monitoring devices um, used for nighttime care um, can provide 
an effective tool in reducing the burden on care professionals and so on. So there's, there's a lot, of, lot more um, to be done in terms of research and the how effective, how efficient um, these tools are. Um, but we already know um, some of the advantages, um, but also some of the issues as well. So some of the challenges um, in the use of care robots. And this is just um, an example of the table um, with illustrative quotes and positive um, aspects of using communication robots. Um, this, is the, this is based on the interviews with care and professionals, so not um, from uh, with older persons themselves. But um, they report some of the negative aspects, so frightening appearance. Um, so those older, the, the current generation of older people in Japan have never grown up using robots or um, they are not necessarily even keen on some anime um, as well. So either so they, for them, um, robots are frightening um, and some of the flashing eyes and so on. So there are certain types of robots that um, frighten them. And also the um, functionality and the capacity um, is still quite limited um, in terms of having come, striking conversations. And then waking up for instance night. So the, they're supposed to support their sleep, but um, some sort of, they are very sensitive to the noise and the, and the movement. And then sometimes they wake them up, all the people up and so on. So based on these um, commercially available robots um, that are used in this nursing home, um, they try to improve. So they, they try to create original robots that are better. So like um, more plush toy type and soft robot and closer to older persons so that they um, don't have any issues with the hearing and um, communication. And so a balance between personalization and the common scenario-based um, com communication conversations built into the system. So but this, they are trying to create a um, better robot and better environment um, so that the um, technologies, uh, the use of technologies can be also can, can improve. And where I um, am based, normally based, um, robots are also coming in. So in Ireland, um, people, um, researchers are developing different kinds of um, robots, but mainly this type of humanized, humanoid robot. Just a few minutes before I um, pass um, on to David. Um, just another study um, which we did together with colleagues in Ireland and um, in Japan at Chiba University and Seina Yoki um, Applied Science, um, University of Applied Science, um, basically wanted to understand um, three types of use, potential users of home care robots. So older people, family carers, and then care professionals. Um, we did a survey um, questionnaire in those three countries. They are all out, um, sort of published um, already. So um, you can have a look um, if you're interested. But um, I just want to go through um, very quickly um, just results focusing on um, older people's response in three countries. So first of all, familiarity with robots. Um, there's not much surprise there um, in terms of um, fam um, Japanese people are the most um, sort of familiar with robots. So they have seen news about robots and so on. And then in interest in news about robots. Um, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're surprised or not surprised, but um, Irish people and Japanese people are interested. And then in terms of negative impression of robots, um, much greater proportion of the re um, respondents in Finland um, said they have very negative um, impression. And then willingness to use home care robots. Um, again, it's a reflection of this negative positive um, impression, um, but um, again, surprisingly, a lot of Irish people are interested in um, using um, home care robots for themselves and also um, the family members. And then capacity, I mean, this view, viewpoints in, re, in regards to home care robots. So what do they actually value 
Um, so from the long list, convenience, entertainment, value, economic efficiency, safety, and so on. Um, just to highlight this capacity to increase mental and physical well-being and comfort. So this is where users' perspectives, multiple types of users' perspective is important. So all the person's perspective, but also care professionals' perspective. And then guarantee of entitlement to receiving human care. Using robots in care settings is still, still very controversial. And if we bring in more and more technologies in there, a lot of people believe um, we should have some kind of guarantee um, to, of, um, to receiving human care. And then in terms of decision, so who makes the decision uh, whether they would like to use home care robots or not, um, and based on what? And it's, um, there are some interesting um, results in terms of the users themselves or the family carers um, or care professionals. So there are multiple dimensions to this um, issue of um, the use of um, care robots. And then in terms of the access to data, um, which the film is going to touch on a little bit um, there. And then functions expected of home care robots, um, conversation, um, so social companionship and so on. Um, that's the highest in Japan, lowest in Finland. And then that's where I would like to stop. Um, I spent nearly 20 minutes. Um, so if you have any questions, um, just sort of burning questions, um, if we read about to this um, part of the, um, the talk, please ask me or um, write in through the chat box. Um, if not, there is question i think uh, there is just a question that came through by ai fukunaga um, okay. um there is an assumption that if reducing the burden for care workers and promoting it industry personal information of elderly people are okay to send to be analyzed without their permission which is happening to my family member in a private nursing home what do you think of the ownership of personal data do i think of the ownership of personal data i mean there are so many, um, there's so much, um, so many issues around eth ethics and um, the use of data, um, privacy, dignity, and so on. So, I mean, I'm surprised to hear um, the use of data, personal information has been used. Um, yeah, I mean, it's if you agree. And then to what extent, like it's the, the use of data and the secondary use of data and so on. So like, again, it's a, the kind of a multiple um, layers um, in this question about the use of um, information. Um, so I guess I would say, obviously it should um, reside with the person themselves, but if you get an approval, would that make them, um, you know, make that okay and um, to use the, to use it for secondary purposes and so on. Like, you know, there's a huge um, issue with that. I think there's another question. Thank you. Yeah, there is, there's also a question in the chat by Ming Chi Ho who asked, what would you think leads to the different perspective in the tri-country comparison where Finland is sort of consistently rating lower than Ireland and Japan? I thought that was quite interesting as well. Yes. Um, let me see. What do I think leads to? Yeah. Um, what's, what I would say is it's very hard to know what causes, I mean, creates these um, differences, um, particularly when we don't know their individual familiarity with the robot. So a lot of um, interest coming in Ireland, found in Ireland, is the kind of reflection of the care shortage in Ireland mm -hmm. and then the, the resources um, issue. But also, because they haven't seen it, I think more Finnish people have seen robots and actually been used than Irish people. So there is a bit of expectation. This is where I think uh, where Davis um, film and interest, um, original interest in the film, making a film um, comes in. Um, like a lot of Japanese people have used it, therefore they are interested or they are, they, you know, they know how to live with robots. Um, in the kind of the, uh, in the Irish case, people have never seen it or people, have higher expectation and that would have created. So I guess, um, depending on the um, respondents and the, the time, this is 
quick you know snapshot of um question it is a questionnaire um cross-sectional um questionnaire so um it's hard to say exactly why this this has been um the case thank you so there's one more question um, by Jenny Schofield. Um, have any of your studies so far looked at the applications of robotics as accessibility technology for disabled people? I would be interested to discuss further with you. Yeah, um, thank you very much, um, Jenny. Um, I haven't. The, um, the quick answer is we have been focused um, very much um, concentrating on all the people at the moment, mm. but um, but there's, and in the team, um, there is, um, there is persons and researchers who have done it and um, who have been looking at assistive technologies broader than robots um, for, um, for the use um, for disabled people. So we are interested um, from that perspective and uh, sort of assistive technologies, so the broader than robots, but also broader sort of a user um, categories. Um, so it'd be great to speak with you at some stage. Thank you very much. All right, uh, thank you for your questions. There will be uh, more occasion to ask questions after the film, but I would like to introduce now the second speaker, um, Professor David Prendergast, who's a social anthropologist and professor of science, technology and society at Maynooth University in Ireland. Um, and he as well has worked on a broad range of topics related to technology and healthcare and um, his book, uh, Aging and the Digital Life Course, um, was named a choice outstanding academic title by the American Library Association. So I'll hand over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm just uh, looking at the comments. There was a, uh, a comment by Ergen Lyon that there's a chance that old people will develop feelings for robots. And I think that's uh, quite an astute, comment. So it's something that is addressed in the film. Uh, so I look forward to seeing what you think, uh, Egan. Right. So thank you very much, everybody, for your interest in my documentary, Circus of Care, Aging in Japan's Robot Revolution. Now, in 2015, as many of you will know, the Japanese government announced the launch of a robot revolution, uh, a huge multi-sector collaborative endeavor developing artificial intelligence, robotics, the Internet of Things, and other advanced technologies and industries. Now, as of, so often happens, whilst much of the investment in development was on advanced industrial systems, a great deal of the, of the narrative pointed towards future value for Japan's aged and aging population. My own research is focused on independent living and aging in place. Um, I have done some of this work in South Korea, um, you know, but most of my work has been in Europe uh, in, in the last decade or two. Um, but I, I've been very interested so when hearing about uh, the robot revolution <clears throat> and, and also kind of other technology claims. Uh, I, I worked for Intel for many years uh, as well. Uh, so I've been long interested in, in understanding what is working and what is hyperbole. Um, the first idea for this documentary arose when I was giving a talk on ethno uh, ethnography and design uh, as part of an event organised by Nanori uh, at University College Dublin. And I was there, I learned about the Hot Rocks programme. Um, I, I was watching various videos um, that, were, that, were, that were being shown uh, during that event, uh, short clips, etc. Uh, and I remember being very curious about whether the bedside guardian robots um, that we were seeing in, in nursing homes uh, had many false alarms of people getting out of bed, uh, and if staff and residents were getting frustrated with this. Um, now, a wonderful opportunity for me arose in late 2019, when I was offered the chance to speak at the, the Future Technologies for Integrated Care annual conference in Tokyo. Uh, this is a gathering of many of the leading researchers, developers, practitioners in this domain in Japan. And it struck me that it offered a, a fantastic opportunity as an anthropologist and filmmaker, to get access to their thoughts and research. Um, it also provided me with a, a brief window of time to visit researchers developing and, and testing assistive technologies for older adults. Uh, and these range from cybernetic walking supports and companion robots to automated sensor networks in nursing homes. So together with now Nori, uh, a, a tiny cobbled together research budget, uh, my filmmaking partner, Daniel uh, Bialtinu, 
and my 16 year old son, Harry, we set out to learn what we could. And we were humbled at how people open their doors to their labs, test beds, companies, nursing facilities and homes to share their experiences using robots and other AI related technologies in the care of older adults in their networks. The bulk of this uh, filmmaking took place just weeks before the pandemic struck, though we did revisit the nursing home a year later to see how these tech uh, online to see how these technologies uh, are being used to help in their fight against COVID-19. It is designed to provide an overview of this film uh, of some of the technologies being developed in Japan. Um, during this film, older adults and care professionals share their experiences of the practical benefits these technologies bring, the problems they create, and the unexpected relationships that can blossom. I hope you find this short documentary interesting and thought provoking. And I do think it creates more questions than it answers. And in this, I judge it to be successful as we need to take very seriously what, why, and how we will design and integrate uh, artificial intelligence into our working lives, should we? Um, both now and into the future. Uh, I hope you enjoy Circus of Care. I'm going to shut up now uh, until the Q&A. Uh, perhaps we could watch the film. Thank you very much for this fascinating um, screening. I'm sure there's lots of questions. I can see some of them already coming in, but just for those who are still thinking, please put your questions either into the chat, uh, into the Q&A box, or you can also um, raise your hand uh, if you want, and we shall unmute you. So I was, I was really struck after the talk uh, by Kodate Sensei at the beginning, I was thinking about the concept of safety. And there's a wonderful, this moment where the professor of law says, well, I have a four year old, you know, granddaughter and she's very dangerous, very cute and dangerous. And so the question is, is what, what actually, are the, are the humans the danger or are the robots the danger and, and how are these, two things mediated. And I think that it's really connected to the question of when we talk about robots in a Western context, usually people assume that there is some kind of autonomous system um, at work. Well, what we really have in the many examples that we've seen uh, in the wonderful documentary is that we can, it's probably more accurate to speak of um, machines that mediate human contact in some way or another. So they, 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 they're not meant to act autonomously. And I was wondering in your own research, and it's a question to both of you, how did this, um, the concept of the robot, how, how did, uh, did you uh, deal with that? Because clearly there's many different understandings at work. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a lot, lot in that question actually. Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, kind of, um, it was it was fascinating just to try and understand what people thought were robots. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, you know, I, I was, and, and then, you know, how people reacted with them. I mean, it kind of goes back to Egon's question earlier, you know, I'll kind of point earlier about the, the, the social relationships that build around robots and how people feel they can interact, et cetera. Uh, what kind of, are they suspending disbelief? Or, you know, those are the types of kind of anthropological kind of questions I, I, I suppose I had going in there. And I kind of did approach it 
you know, quite skeptically in many ways, you know, I kind of hadn't uh, anticipated that I would get the, you know, that I would be witnessing the level of interaction that I, that you see in the film, actually, you know, that uh, now I'm always, you know, I mean, the, the interviews we, we t took place over relatively short periods of time. So as an anthropologist, I've been much more interested in seeing how these things happen over time uh, and whether they're maintained, et cetera, in these, these relationships and these notions of whether something is, you know, the robot is still an actor, you know, the robot is still given agency or has agency, you know, so, um, and, and that kind of, dip, you know, even if it's not kind of has its own autonomous AI, you know, it's kind of people are going to create, uh, you know, notions of, of, of interaction with the robot, you know, and, uh, um, you know, we saw that in terms of the, you know, uh, the, the Ibo robot and how it would wander off and it would do things that were unexpected. And, you know, it, that serendipity that was inherent to those interactions, some of them programmed, some of them not, some of them were unexpected and way beyond the kind of what would have been expected by the developers and programmers. That was kind of, that's kind of essential to the notion of co-presencing, really. You know, I think, you know, that, and that's why I use that quote at the end, you know, about the flaws of the robot being quite important because that came across quite heavily uh, for me. Um, yeah, so that's a start <laughs> on your big question. <laughs> you know, there were other questions, there were other kind of thoughts as you were talking, you know, about the, the safety issues, you know, about the use cases, you know, some of the robots, you know, essentially, you know, some of the robot beds, for instance, and kind of those single, more single use pieces uh, for transferring aids or, or et cetera. Those are going to be, you know, designing those very carefully are, are really important. And there was, you know, there were attempts to kind of do this with humanoid robots that were not very uh, practical, really, in terms of helping older people with frail, you know, kind of bones and skin to kind of transfer. And you know, there were other ways to to to, to do that. Uh, I think another piece, uh, just in terms of you, you mentioning is, and, and there's, there's a bit of the film that I had to cut out, unfortunately, there was a, there was a wonderful talk, there's a lot of the film I had to cut out to keep it down to 30 minutes, uh, unfortunately, um, but there was, well, there was a, a, a roboticist who kind of, who, who, you know, he's a very famous roboticist in Japan who was talking, and he was talking about the kind of, for him, some of his concerns uh, about robots and safety, et cetera, um, were really about AI, um, about sure networking as, as the director of the nursing home talks about at the end. Um, but for him, it, you know, it's the fact that, you know, AI and some of the forms of advanced AI that are coming are black box. It goes beyond what the developers would have imagined in creating algorithms, um, you know. And so I think that for him was one of the major issues because it's, you know, it goes beyond the expected, you know, what can be planned for. Um, anyway, there's just a few, a few thoughts based upon your, your question. Thank you. So now do you have any input? Yeah, thank you very much um, for businesses. So um, what I would just add there is um, the kind of the importance of trust um, at the organizational level. Um, I mean, this is a particular kind of a case, um, you know, the use of robots within the context of residential nursing home. And we interviewed um, several different nursing homes, um, not for this film, but for the Project Hub. And um, there are different reasons, the initial reason of introducing robots and the incentives. Like a lot of incentives are like financial and I also the lack of resources and so on. But that's really, for me, um, it starts to be become clear. Um, that's not the kind of source of success, just in terms of bringing robots. I mean, it doesn't have to be robots, but the obviously robot takes the shape of human or, you know, animals. Or I mean, so it's a different um, from the safety and monitoring system, like a camera, for instance. And as soon as it takes that form and this kind of interactions starts to take place, human and um, robot. And then, but the robot coming in to that space where I think safety is important, care is important, and there has to be trust. And so care professionals have to trust um, the introduction of robots is not kind of a replacement of their work and the value and the variation of their work. And also 
all the persons have to feel safe. So like robots not started to start, you know, sing and attack them or whatever, you know, like the kind of the fear. Um, so I guess where there is trust from before the introduction of robots, there is a chance because everybody's working towards, you know, importance of care and quality of care, safety and so on and so forth. So um, I think it kind of comes down to that, but I mean, obviously um, the robots, having the robots can increase the sense of security, safety and so on, but it could go the, the other way. So that balance is really important. Thank you very much. There's, there's another question in the chat that, that, that relates directly to that by Polina Colata, who asks, thank you for two very interesting presentations and a fascinating documentary. I wonder whether you could expand a little bit on the tensions between care and surveillance. Are the risks human made or technology made? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll kind of hand that over to, to now really, but like, you know, I mean, I suppose, you know, I've been, you know, I mean, working as a technologist uh, or an anthropologist working with technologists over the years, you know, this is often, uh, you know, something that's discussed by technologists, you know, and kind of they're always, we're asking, well, how can we, you know, if we, for instance, we're using um, uh, camera technologies, we're kind of, you know, with an AI behind them, we're monitoring people's actions, etc., for, and often for, you know, laudable purposes from that perspective you know which is kind of use cases around people falling out of bed in this particular case or people with dementia wandering or whatever there's, there's usually a, a, a good reason but it's about how that is then implemented and the kind of the discussions uh, that happen around that uh, both with the older person and the, the network around them and the various actors within that network I think that's really important that that's designed as much as the technology. You know, I think that's something that we really need to be thinking about. And, and that's why I think the kind of growth of service design is so important right now, you know, rather than just looking at the interactions, et cetera. I think this is the, the, the social bit that we should be looking at. And, you know, and is it, is it enough to just have these filters? You know, is it, you know, can we really guarantee the, that when, you know, that this, you know, what is happening to this data, you know, is it kind of, is it running through the cloud? What are the risks of that? You know, is it a closed loop system? You know, all those kinds of things kind of need to be worked through. Um, I'm teaching my students at the moment and I'm thinking about using the coded bias documentary. I don't know if anybody's seen it, uh, you know, as part of that teaching, uh, you know, and, and discussing some of these issues, you know, Anybody, you know, is, is in terms of surfacing some of these the, 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 these questions as well. Okay, uh, now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um. So the tensions between care and surveillance. I mean, in a sense, yeah. When I mentioned trust, um, that was probably um the answer. But um, there are multiple users, multiple stakeholders. Um, and then it really depends. I mean, it is really subjective. Um. So certain people in the same organization, nursing home basically objected i mean you know they didn't want to use the robot and um, so they had a choice of saying no and um, to the the simple use i mean that's just the introduction of the tool and um, instrument and then the way it's actually being used i mean there's also um subjectivity and um, some people probably feel it's an intrusion of um privacy even though um, as you saw, the silhouette and um, kind of a images that are uh, that are captured by the um, monitoring sensor. Some people would see it as surveillance still, but um, in the case, I mean, like when people accept it, um, that is actually enhancing quality of care. I mean, it's because it's, if you think about it, it's like you know, the, during the nighttime, the highest risk is for. And like when the fall happens, then that the kind of deteriorates the whole kind of quality of life and so on. Like and it could reduce um, mental capacity as well. So it's at most sort of priority for the care staff and family members. So some people who agreed um, to be sort of being monitored that way, they of course saw it as care. But like third person looking at that thing, oh goodness you know sake I don't want that and so on and so forth so it's I don't know how to there's no really I'm not answering the question but um 
there's the always remains tension there um, between care and surveillance. So that's why trust is important, organizational sort of a support is important, and so on so forth. That's that's very interesting. I think we quite we get a, quite a lot of questions um, on all channels. Uh, really, let me put two together here. There's one in the chat um, by Egon Lyon who asks, "What about human contact um, with the disappear or where human contact really is needed?" And there's a similar question in the Q and A by Heather Jochens uh, who asks, "One concern people have had during this pandemic." is how the lack of physical human connection has adversely affected the elderly in care homes. Is this a concern that has been expressed with the talk of introducing robots into care work? So the question of whether that can replace human contact or not. Hmm. You know, I think it's been heartbreaking, um, you know, seeing what's been happening in nursing homes across the world. Um, you know, I, I, I've got a bit of an insight and we've shown some of those in terms of the nursing home within Japan in uh, in, in Ireland, you know, the, not only have the nursing homes been hit so badly by the pandemic, uh, many, many deaths of both residents and staff, um, but the, the, um, the consequences that we've seen uh, of people being unable to have sufficient human contact uh, either with staff or with, with their family members who are no longer able to, to visit them is, is being shocking uh, and probably not wholly un unexpected, but I think it's something that, you know, we all have to reflect upon. And I don't think that even with, you know, the social uh, technologies that we have these days, um, robots are not going to replace that. You know, there's, it's, it's just, you need to find ways to kind of manage and, and bring these relationships together, I think. Um, there's a, again, there's a bit of the film that I've cut and I'm feeling really guilty. I think there needs to be a longer version of this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but there's, um, there was a, a lovely uh, discussion with the nursing home manager uh, about, uh, when I was asking about this, this same question about human contact uh, and, and the robots. Um, and I do think there is a you know very re re real possibility you know that you know you 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 know we talk about augmenting using technology to augment support and and you know and I think that's that's again a laudable aim um, but again we also have to be very careful about how we design these services or we design these things into you know and, and make sure that we're not in, in in inadvertently kind of doing exactly that I think there's there's a lot of things these robots can do they can help I mean what we saw with the um, in, in the nursing home that you know it actually acted and i know pyro uh, the inventor of pyro said the same thing that it, you know, these robots can sometimes act as kind of uh, think, uh, as i suppose um artifacts inside the nursing home that generate conversations that generate sociality etc um but i when i was talking with the nursing home director in japan and uh, uh we we had this wonderful conversation where I asked a question based upon some of the things that were going on in Ireland with robots and where people were using these kind of humanoid robots to um, kind of run bingo sessions and dance sessions and, you know, et cetera, and just experimenting with that as, as, a, as a notion. And I asked her, is that on her plans? Did she plan to do this? And she was kind of shocked. You know, she's like, no, that would, you know, that's what human beings are for. That's what our carers are for. This whole idea is about giving the opportunity, more them more opportunity to do that, which I thought was very, very interesting, you know. So, again, it's the type of thing I, you know, in retrospect, I wish I hadn't got, but I, I just had so much, uh, much, you know, uh, you know, so, so much material. Right. No, Nori? Yeah. Um, so... I think in the film, um, the manager or um, care professional, um, I can't remember who said it, but <clears throat> basically the use of robot should create um, time for person-centered or person-to-person -person, um, kind of interaction. So um, if that thought is shared amongst all the staff members, and if that is actually put to practice, I guess that's that's okay. Um, but um, often again, this standardization and personalization, I think um, David was talking about, there is also tension, like you know, how much 
um, time you're going to spend doing this physical exercise and you know session, or is that task can be um, sort of delegated, uh, sort of a de delegated to um, robots. And then the other aspects that they um, human being like so again there are, I think different views um, about when is the right moment to use technologies and the rob robots not human beings. I mean, lot, I mean my students like when they watch this film said like why <laughs> why can't we invest more money in care setting and so on so it's like they they are views obviously this sort of a dichotomy cold care versus warm care and as long as technologies come in and hard shell robots humanoid robots coming in that's cold care it's not that simple straightforward and um, that's my um sort of experience um listening to people and care and um, professionals working there and also family members so um yeah i th I, th I should stop here um for now but there are lots of tensions thank you yes we're i think we're all awaiting the director's cut um that will hopefully be re released at, at, at some point um we have a, a live question here from uh, barbara pizziconi uh, have I been admuted? Can yes. You? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, Barbara Pizziconi here. Um, I am a linguist, so my question really um, stems from my interest in, in, in language. Um, uh, I think just, just to picking up on what was just said uh, is, is, of course, there's no black, black and white question about, you know, what computer, oh, sorry, what robots can do, but I, I think it becomes a legitimate question when we are talking about um, uh, social computer uh, robots. I don't know why I keep saying computers. Social robots. So this 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 area of sociality that um, uh, we we need to get used to robots doing the things that humans do, right? So we, it's it's an area that needs 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 to be uh, discovered by users and 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 um, getting uh, get get used to. Um, my question really has to do to. Um, uh, with the planning of how these robots communicate with humans and 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 how they are designed to speak and and I don't know much about um, robots in in home care but I'm always rather um, surprised by how how stereotypical many of these robots sound um, maybe robots that are used more for entertainment uh, purposes but uh, how stereotypical their language is often you know stereotypes of femininity or or um, cuteness kawaii kind of speech styles and so i'm 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 wondering whether you heard anything whether you can tell anything about the 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 decisions that are made on how robots are supposed to communicate or speak um, to humans um, in um, the domain of, of, of social robotics and, and home care in particular. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so <laughs> uh, this is not my area, I have to say, you know, in terms of designing and language, but uh, it's a, it is a fascinating question, really. I think kind of, you know, uh, and it's it is a discussion that I've kind of had with my wife really in terms of looking at these 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 technologies and she noticed this kind of this use of cuteness etc uh, within the Japanese context and how would that work within the Irish context for instance you know in different cultural situations um, I, I suppose one thing that is worth noting is that you know with robots like Sophia um, you know you know that you know are, are robots that kind of have, are really uh, have very well and, and highly developed um, kind of you know, likenesses to human beings that can often be off-putting. Um, you know, so you know, and this is that uncanny valley that you know that needs to be overcome. That kind of worry about you know, so actually having something that is quite other. Can actually, uh, you know, I, I wonder is it, you know, it may be a strategy here, but um, I don't know if now if you have anything. That's a great question, by the way. It's a great design question. Yes, um, thank you very much, um, Barbara. Since so, um, when we brought in commercially available robots, um, their voice was set um, um, to kind of sound as five year old boy. Um, 
and that worked for some people but it didn't work for others so when we decided to develop an or original robot um plush toy sort of soft cuddly um robot we went for this kawaii thing for the appearance um but we actually had to slow down the speech itself so it's it's no longer kind of a boy just speaking as the kind of normal at normal speed it, I think you heard it, like um, I think one of the films during the um, pandemic. Um, so the robot really speaks slowly and it's there's no kawaii or there's no, like it's basically, it's just really about input and output, which was also mentioned by the um, care manager. So for all the people, and if, if the robot is made for um, different target audience, target um, sort of children and so on, children with autism and so on and so forth. I mean, I think there have to be different types of voice, different types of speed and so on and so forth. Um, and I think there has to be a lot of testing of these different um, kind of people. So that that's all I know. And I don't exactly know whether they can actually find like the, the optimal um, sort of a sound or the, the voice or the language um, use. So. Thank you. Yeah, that's a really, I, I think, a question that, that the many of us were thinking about. Um, there's a, quite there's quite a few more. There's eight more questions um, in the chat. We'll I'll just go through um, in order. Next question is from Lyman Gamberton, who asks, um, or who says, I was struck by the strength of affection directed to the robot dog by its owner. She simultaneously recognized the dog as a robot, e.g. talking about it charging in the morning while talking about it as a living animal, uh, i.e. it falls asleep in funny places. Could you elaborate a little on the emotional dynamics of this non-human companionship? And we have a similar question um, sort of asking about the emotional uh, dynamics uh, a little bit uh, further down by Valentina Strakova who asked, what do we know about the process of establishing a relationship between an elderly user and a communication robot? What makes the robots endearing to the user? Have you explored how different materials change how the user perceives the robots? Thank you very much for sharing your wonderful research with us. Hmm. That's great, thank you. Some really good questions. Um, yeah, the, the uh, I suppose in terms of materials, now knowing probably has quite a bit to say about uh, the use of materials for different purposes and different robots, et cetera, especially in some of the more plusher robots and, um, you know, the kind of the, the, the forms of movements, the kind of, ta the, the, you know, tactile kind of, you know, uh, I think this, this is, this is, you know, it's not just the materials, it's the kind of, uh, the way these, um, th these devices feel. And, you know, the barriers um, to developing the relationship uh, were quite clear in, you know, I thought it was one of the interesting elements in, in the film within that, you know, as we kind of unfolded that relationship with that the lady had with her uh, robot dog and, um, you know, the, the fact that it's, um, there are times when it has downtime, you know, that she wants it to be interactive during that point when it's charging, um, you know, the, you know, but equally, the fact that it breaks is endearing to her. You know, the fact that, well, not that it breaks, but that it kind of, it, it does things that are unexpected, like it ends up in a, in a closet somewhere, or, you know, it kind of ends up in, you know, it kind of winds down at different points. Uh, one thing I found interesting with her was that she'd kind of, she, she'd originally received the, uh, and, and I do think she had that, that, that kind of relationship of kind of, yes, I know <laughs> that it's a robot, uh, but equally, um, it is making a difference in my life. Um, and, you know, it's especially in lots of apartments, for instance, where you can't have a pet, you can't have, you know, uh, or, you know, having filling those empty spaces in the day uh, is often done by the TV or the radio or those kind of those different things. And it's just how it's just another way and for her in many ways. She kind of says it's the co-presencing piece. It's the kind of it's enough that she knows it's there, you know, and it's it's doing things and she's able to interact with it. Uh, in terms of some of the, how she kind of really engaged with it, it tended to be in that case, in that particular robot, it was with her grandchildren as a toy and kind of, she was delighted about that, that it kind of was something with her young grandchildren, but then the relationship then took off beyond that. You know, in many ways that, you know, cause the, in some ways the, the, 
like the, the robot can be quite intrusive. You're there, you're kind of perhaps, you know, there's a bunch of people together and then the, the robot's coming over and it's yipping and it's kind of trying to be get, attract your attention or it's going over to the TV. Um, you know, but then it's also creating the, these moments. Um, I do, I'll just reiterate what I said, I think about the kind of the flaws of the robot, that's ever so important. And sometimes those are kind of designers are building those in as well. For instance, you know, the the, the clip where you kind of see the, the robot saying, listen, can I just have a, a rest, you know, because it's kind of, you know, uh, it is a question about how, how, how long does that last? You know, those, those types of kind of those moments. Okay, uh, across to you now. Thank you. Um, not much to add, but um, <clears throat> I think in the case of Ibo um, and the owner, um, I think it's the the movement. I mean, then there's a novelty aspect for sure, um, and um, but also the the movement that is really imitating real dog. Um, I mean, it's still simplified in many ways, but um, it's, it's that sort of a kind of a generates curiosity and that kind of. Um, I mean, obviously, creates the interactions with the human beings, like talking about it and so on. So, um, she um told me not like during the interview, but um, she didn't have much expectation at the beginning. Um, when I actually I think her sister brought that dog to her, and then the reaction of her grand um son, like which um they mentioned, and the so on so forth. So, and then she got more and more curious. Um, so. That's how she developed, like it grew more attached um, to dog. And because she has, you know, mental capacity. Um, so knowing it's actually not a real dog, but she remains curious about it. So again, the question is, I mean, it's not always the same with other types of robots. How long will people use? And will they actually get bored? Will they get actually, because it's not a living thing. Um, so it's different but um it serves certain purposes and in this case killing time when she's alone and so on and so forth and she she talks about that she also talks about kind of like moments like when she picks up the dog and it stops moving you know in a way that you know i think those types of things will obviously be have to be worked upon um you know, uh, going forward. I mean, she, she, it was it was a fascinating interview, and she kind of go on, and most of it's could obviously, um, but those kind of bits, um, you know, where she, she, I mean, she had some fascinating and really, really insightful uh, comments to make about how she felt these things could be improved and kind of would better fit into her household. Thank you. Um, there's a question by Anne Aronson, um, who writes, uh, thank you for your talk, Professor Kodate and the evocative documentary, Professor Prendergast. My question to both of you are as follows. One, machines are already embedded within our lives, but as we start to treat machines as if they are almost human, we may begin to develop habits that will cause us to treat human beings as almost machines. What does loving social robots mean? For example, as we saw in the documentary, what does it mean to love Eibel? That's the first question. And the second is, in terms of acceptance of robotic devices, what is defined, perceived as natural versus what is unnatural or artificial in Japan? Yeah, these are uh, fascinating questions. Anori, I think you can take this one for, to start. So. <laughs> Thank you, um, David, um, and and Sensei. I, I know you. I think you're you're actually a specialist in this, and so you probably know the answers. Um, yeah, I mean, it's very different. I mean, the, the case again, like just using Japan as the case study um, for this. I mean, Japan has the government, and the, you know, it's a you know kind of very much um, in the public policy domain, and it's being pushed out. Um, so the government wants you to use more robots. Um, the government wants industry to develop more robots. Um, so it's kind of driven, you know, the driver come from somewhere else, um, apart from just human robot interactions. But I do recognize the danger um, of sort of living the kind of virtual reality and especially um, in the case of other people and um, the care homes and so on, this, mental capacity um decision making capacity and so on if people start to believe um or they can't tell you know what's the reality and so on i think that's where there's 
like a lot of ethical issues coming in. And I, I don't have the answer, like, and how we can deal with that. Um, so there's like, obviously guidance, guidelines coming out and so on. Um, but um, it is still a very human uh, question. Um, what does loving social robots mean? Um, yeah, I really don't have the answer. I'm sorry, I really need to think about this. Um, but um, David, I'll pass it on to you. Um, and I keep thinking about your questions. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the, this is going to be something I'm going to have to think about because, you know, you've brought up a really interesting question of um, as, as we start to treat machines as if they're almost human, we may begin to develop habits that will cause us to treat human beings as almost machines. And I do think that this is a real problem uh, uh, or it's a concern. It's something that we have to be thinking about as we think about society now and we think about how we're using algorithms and it goes way beyond social robotics. Um, it, it, it think about how what data is being collected, how that's being utilized, what how that's driving decisions um you know around you know court cases or cvs or you know what happens with interviews there you know it, it's a it's a really big question and i don't think that kind of it's you know and i don't think you're reducing it to, to robots at all i think you know it's a really very very important question um i think robots you know kind of and in, they interact as an embodiment in 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 the, in the world and you know that that may have something to do with this but it is i think this is these are some of the big questions about time you know i think these are some of the questions that we need to be addressing um you know whether as, a, as anthropologists or policymakers or developers uh, so thank you very much for that question yeah, I, I thought that actually a similar thing because at the beginning when the the uh, pepper does the radio taiso you immediately think, ah, the reason why the robot can do this so easily is because the movements in and of themselves uh, already have uh, some somewhat robotic uh, quality. So I think that's a really uh, interesting question uh, to follow up. Um, I, there's two more questions that we can put together that are slightly more financially orientated. Uh, the first one is, uh, what is the evidence of cost effectiveness of physical robots, not sensors? And what is the trade-off between more expensive tech cost and reduced utility? Asks Professor Ala Shepura from Coventry University. And uh, we have a second anonymous question in the similar vein, um, asking how affordable are robots in Japan and how widespread is their use in care? If you have any data to share, thank you. Great. Okay, this is definitely Nao's area, not mine. Uh, you know, in, in relation to to, to, to this, this, uh, I, I will say that I, um, I, you know, I was blown away by how expensive some of these technologies are. Like those eyeball dogs, I'm not sure if it's still the case, but you know, looking at maybe three thousand dollars or whatever. Maybe I'm wrong, uh, but they they were very very expensive. Some of the technologies because they're 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 emergent. You know, they're not scaled at the moment. Um, I think kind of there's been attempts to, you know, like with the soft bank, bank pepper, et cetera, you know, and kind of trying to find new use case and exploring. And I think that's going to happen. I, I'm, I'm, I still think this is in its infancy. I think robotics in general and social robotics, uh, kind of the guardian work the, the in care homes, this is not a developed area. Speaking as someone that's worked in the technology industry for a long time, I think there's a lot of space there. I think it's also, like in many areas of e-health as well, it's it's a market of pilots. You know, there's lots of things going on, but it's not really achieved scale yet. The markets are still being worked out, and will you know? And 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 again, I think there needs to be more and more investment into you know the service design aspects of these as well to really understand how these are going to fit in. Just putting a robot into a nursing home is there's a cost there, there's a capital cost, etc. You know, especially if it's linked in with kind of different ways data is flowing. But there's also the kind of all those costs of maintaining these things and in, and kind of building them into their action interactions of the nursing home. Uh, that has to be designed, have to be thought about. Um, you know, so those though, and, and I don't think those costs tend to be kind of you know what what cost is there in terms of staff time? Is there a member of staff that's dedicated to these, or do these things just end up in a cupboard because after a while there isn't a member of staff who's looking after them? So again, I'm just trying to kind of problematize you know this this element a bit and just bring it to the fore and thinking about the economics of, uh, of this. Um, but I, I I kind of probably was expecting 
more in Japan, actually, to be honest, you know, in terms of, you know, I was amazed at kind of what I saw in the nursing home and what was being tested in some, you know, but it, it certainly wasn't um, anywhere. And it seemed more close to the hyperbole, <laughs> you know, I think this is, this is something that's developing. But and now, Nori, what, what would you say to this? Yeah, thank you very much, Alison. So, um, so cost effectiveness, um, it's, it's, I think, as David said, at this point, it's more about the effectiveness. We, we still don't know um, how effective they are um, for what. And so it's, again, it's been pushed by the government as a kind of additional item to support um, care. Um, and also, I think there is definitely an effort, which I actually um, appreciate, in terms of changing the image of care industry and care sector. Um, so to create a better work environment, I mean, you may not, you may disagree um, with, you know, bringing more technologies may not necessarily make the workplace better, but um, there are certain um, aspects of care in social care. I'm not talking about medical and the hospital setting. It is the care homes. Um, there are certain um, aspects about the the hard hardship and the challenges and the physical and um, physically challenging um, workplace environment which obviously leads to the loss of um, trained care staff so to support them and um, bringing into um, technologies um, exoskeleton I mean and power suits and so on um, has a value for sure but um, again it's not replacement so therefore it's an additional cost. And in terms of nursing homes making the decisions to buy purchase these, it is still a big, big decision. Um, so there could be like over time det det detrimental impact in terms of hiring human um, carers because they bring in those you know, kind of expensive technologies. But uh, there are also aspects about um, the, the gaps between needs and the kind of technologies that have been developed. So um, there have been a lot of efforts um, to bring stakeholders together to actually look at this and um, I guess including the cost and I think there was some question and um, probably early on um, about how spread how, how actually how many you know care homes actually using these robots there aren't many um, care homes and that's part of, partly because the, the lack of training it actually is additional cost additional cost not just the economic cost the psychological cost, like you know, um, human carers have to relearn some of the skills. They they'd rather um, lift up um, all the person, you know, before wearing all the power suits. And all of these aspects have to be considered. So there has to be kind of a systems kind of a thinking in terms of care as an overall kind of ecological and um, sort of a landscape um, in that context. So I stop here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. We've already gone almost 10 minutes uh, over time, so I think it's it's time to stop now. Apologies for those who have asked questions uh, whom we couldn't uh, get to answer, um, but please join me in thanking Professor Kodate and Professor Prendergast for really a thought-provoking presentation and film screening. I'm sure this will lead to lots of conversations that we will take uh, further uh, from here. Thank you very much um, for joining us uh, today. And I just want to briefly announce our next talk, which will be held on the 26th of uh, January. So in two weeks time, uh, the title is Udagawa Yoan, pioneer of botany and chemistry studies in Japan from Western sources. And the talk will be given by Dr. Yona Siderer from the Edelstein Center for the History and Philosophy of Science, Technology and Medicine at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. So we'll continue our topic uh, of uh, science and technology, uh, both historical and contemporary. But for now, please join me in thanking the presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great questions. Okay. Thank you.